Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Iran of the Pahlavi era, the Shah's government, and the Arab-Israeli conflict, a topic that um, has been often spoken about, but I hope to show that with the, with the archival, with the new archival uh, holdings at, at, at the Zahiri archives at Hoover here, um, we can sort of open new vistas to them. Um, it is well known that Iran of the Shah had rather close ties with Israel. Under uh, the Shah's government, there were security ties, there were energy ties, there were commercial ties. Many Iranians uh, visited Israel. Um, there are generations of Iranian babies who used to be called Israeli babies because the Iranian mothers would go to get fertility treatment in Israel. Um, there were Iranian singers uh, who would sing in Israel. There were Israeli singers who would sing in Iran. That there were rather extensive ties. While unlike what many think, um, the two governments didn't actually have official ties, open ties. I, there were not official diplomatic relations between the two countries. The question is, what explains these close ties between Iran and Israel at the era? Um, and, and what was really the nature of them? Um, you know, if, if they were so close, how come they weren't open? These are some of the questions I hope to talk about today based on my research and based on my findings. Now, there are usually a few explanations given uh, uh, to explain uh, the reality of these ties. One of the most popular ones is the sort of periphery policy or the periphery, periphery, periphery policy. Uh, it is well known that the government of David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, had a policy that since Israel obviously could not be friends with its neighbors, it should be friends with the neighbors of its neighbors. I, since it was in conflict with the Arab countries surrounding it, it should, be, it should build links with the non-Arab countries of the Middle East, the fellow non-Arab countries of the Middle East, that is Iran, Turkey, and, and Ethiopia. Um, there were many reasons for these links and they set a time. Then there's a the Cold War explanation. I naturally, since Iran and Israel both found themselves on the side of the US in the early 50s, first years of the founding of Israel and the first years of Mohammad Reza Shah's really return to power following the 1953 coup in Iran, naturally they would be on the same side. Um, and there's of course this sort of the official Islamic Republic narrative, if you will, which actually it's kind of also very close to what was the official, um, I would say perhaps the new left explanation at the time, the opponents of the Shah's regime had a very basic answer. Of course, Shah has good relations to Israel. It's subservient to the US. It does what the US tells it. That's why it has good relations to Israel. If you notice what all these explanations have in common is that none of them actually explains the motivations um, of the Shah regime itself um, and of the country of, of a country like Iran, which had a diplomatic apparatus, which, which, which had, you know, which had its own independent policy making. Periphery policy explains it as a policy of Israel. The other explanations also explain it as policy of the US. But why the Shah regime, um, where the Shah itself and the Iranian state decided for this? Um, there's also a lot of discussions when it comes to Iranian foreign policy of that era of the role of individuals. Since we often don't have access to diplomatic archives, we have access to memoirs. So there's a lot of discussions actually about the role of Adishi Zahedi, um, who was seen as, as negative at the time, was seen as negative by, the, by, by some in Israel um, and by some, like Mayor Ezri, a sort of very well-known Iranian sort of Zionist activist uh, who was, you know, who lived in Iran and often acted on behalf of Israel in different ways or as in between. Um, and this is again explained in many memoirs as to the role of Ardashir Zahedi when he was foreign minister and was leading Iranian diplomat. Um, there is even a mention of Ardashir Zahedi's sort of possibly negative role when he leaves the foreign, uh, foreign ministry in 1971. He's no longer foreign minister. Davar, which is a major newspaper in Israel, explains, you know, sort of celebrates that almost or talks about it as a fact of, you know, um, this was good news for Israel relations. But what I'm hoping to um, talk about today um, and the approach that I'm hoping to suggest is that if you want to understand Iranian foreign policy, if you want to understand how it is made, what were its motivations, what were its sort of uh, uh, contradictions, um, we are well served to look at the Iranian archives just like we do with any other country. In fact, it's striking um, that because of the sort of lack of archival resources sometimes, we can read pages after pages about sort of foreign policy of Iran at the time, 
based on a variety of, of guesses of uh, insinuations, but not, you know, not the actual archival records. So, and even memoirs basically have that quality. I mean, what does it really mean that a person was known to have this view or that view based on memoirs that were written 50, late, 50 years later? There's no other country, again, if you pick up a book about US foreign policy, you know, you rarely are going to have as main explanator. I mean, the job of historians uh, is usually to look at basically our cover record at a time, not recollections um, of, of later years of memoirs. Of course, they can be important and they can be added on, but not as the main. Now, but of course, this would be easy to say when we don't have the resources. You know, it would be a very classic historian thing to say, oh, well, it would be great if you have these archives, um, but we don't really have them. So what does it really mean? Well, I'll go to this and then back. Well, now we do, <laughs> as I have discovered to my delight in the last two months, the Zahedi papers at Hoover present a truly golden opportunity to go and look at different levels of decision-making, um, to go and look at, as, at how policy was made in Iran in, inside the foreign ministry, and to go and see what were the different contradictions um, while the policy was being made. These archives are not complete, of course. They're not a replacement of um, the full diplomatic archives you find in other parts of the world. Um, Professor Milani has written and explained in his work how Adi Shizahedi himself apparently actually had a key ro uh, role in bringing sort of professional note taking um, to foreign policy meetings. Um, but of course, Adi Shizahedi was foreign minister, you know, in a relatively sort of short period. And then he was, and he was an ambassador to the United States also in two periods, but there's before and after. It can be frustrating um, when you're following something to see that there's a gap. Um, it is also not clear uh, entirely, you know, what were the documents he was able to get out. Uh, you know, I'm sure it was not sort of in ideal conditions necessarily, but nevertheless, what is very clear in the last two months of me going every day to over and spending a few hours there, that there's a belt of information, belt of Iranian foreign policy documents um, that certainly are enough for, I think, my lifetime of work and, and, and a few others. So basically, students who want to work on this and the scholars, I think, don't have, no longer have an excuse that we don't have. These archives are particularly rich because they include a variety of sources. They include published, um, I internally, be it in, internally published, sorry. Um, I don't know why my phone gets provoked by the word publish, but uh, um, be it internally, um, like internal really top secret documents, but they also include a variety of levels. There is, there is this sort of form of document called Sharaf Yabi, which is basically a document of for the view of the Shah, um, a summary of things that happened that Shah has to see. There, there are different versions of these documents, right? I mean, there is the final version, there's the edited version, there's a version coming from the other side, um, how they have been mixed. Um, there are press clippings. There, apparently, the very interesting service existed at the time. I was shocked to learn this. Um, where you could, there were agencies where you could hire and see, you know, whenever my name comes in the press, because it was a very vibrant press in Iran in, in certain periods, 41 to 53, just bring it to me. And some of this exists in the Fazl al Azadi spot. And of course, relevant to my topic, Fazl al Azadi was interned in Palestine, actually, when Palestine was a site of um, British internment camps, and Fazl al Azadi was there. So that's his recollection. So a very rich source exists here. I don't know, and I want to go back to this is the, sort of one of the titles of my dissertation, running titles of my dissertation called but from below. Um, you know, when Roma was reading it, you might have noticed that, oh, it doesn't seem to be directly, you know, what my dissertation doesn't seem to be directly related to the talk. I think what is related is the approach of what I call cold war from below. I, the studies of the Cold War have often looked at superpowers um, in, in Moscow and Washington to explain this. In fact, if you read some of the central um, you know, important narratives of the Cold War, let's say John Lewis Gaddis's Cold War, the only, the only actors that really appear are not even sort of members of parliament. They're, they're usually leading government figures on both sides. 
um, but both sides being the Soviet Union and the United States. I think research here shows that I, I mean Cold War from below in two sets. I mean that on a societal level, people were involved in the Cold War. They cared about this global struggle that was going on. And on the, on the country level, they, um, they also cared about it. I, the Shah of Iran was not a passive subject of the Cold War. He was not a victim of superpower uh, uh, sort of power uh, games between each other. And he was not also in another tradition that exists in the Cold War. He was not someone who was, this is often said about the President Nasser of Egypt and others, but not someone who was just trying to um, smartly play the superpowers against each other like mommy and daddy and sort of had no interest of his own. I hope to, to show um, that that's not the case. I hope to show that the Shah of Iran, Iran of the family of era, had in fact a conscious, consistent foreign policy that was not like, like all other, pol other policies, it wasn't always followed, but that if you look at it throughout a long uh, period, you can see elements of it. And elements that are frankly surprising or certainly go against um, some of the dominant assumptions we have. Now, I wanna also emphasize that like a good historian, I have really been uh, guided um, by the archives. I, I have been guided by the empirical evidence. In fact, for some other work that I had on Iran and Vietnam, I really started out showing how Shah followed US's policy in Vietnam. I thought that was the paper. It turned out that my paper uh, about a different topic turned out to be about perhaps the opposite, i.e. how Shah did not follow US policy in Vietnam. So I think it's good, um, I think it's good to remember that. Now, let me start with um, what is called Siyasat Mustaqal Milli, national independent policy. Throughout this period, Shah kept claiming that Iran follows what he called national independent policy. In Persian, we don't have a system of capitalizing words, but this basically appears like a, cap like a capitalized, like a central phrase that is always used. I, it's not just that he said we have a policy, you know, it was not just that he was trying to use nice words like national independent. This was a, this was a consistent phrase uh, used by Iran. And in fact, if you see this newspaper title on the top, it says, why is West working against Iran, the national independent policy? I, not only the Shah was meant to say that he follows the policy of national independent, he also saw that in contradiction, not just with the Soviet Union, but, but with the West. And it sort of counters our dominant image of a West following Shah that we have. Now, what did national independent policy mean, mean when it comes to the central conflict of the era in our region, of the Middle East, by the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I use Arab-Israeli conflict, I think I used Palestinian-Israeli conflict in the previous iteration. To be clear, I use the, the term Arab-Israeli conflict to talk about the broader, right? not just Israel's clash with the Palestinians, but Israel's war with the Arab countries, right? Egypt and Syria chiefly, um, and the series of war in 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, um, that, uh, that he had. So we want to see what was his national independent policy um, in relation to in relation to Israel Palestine. And was it really, you know, was it how national and how independent was it perhaps we can talk about, but also what were its elements and what did it actually mean and what evidence do we have in this sort of record to, to, to say this? I think it would be necessary to give a very brief overview of how did I don't have it in the slides, but uh, I think I can do it on the fly, as I say. Um, up to what, what, what were the relations? How did things stand between Iran and Israel Palestine? Um, Iran, so, you know, I assume you know the basics, obviously, following the First World War, Palestine, which used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, forms, uh, it un comes under the control of Britain, the British mandate of Palestine is formed. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration promises a Jewish national home. There is sort of Jewish settlement in, in Palestine. Iran, as one of the major states, um, as one of the major states of the era, um, had, uh, had the consular presence in Jerusalem already. Right? There was an Iranian consular presence uh, in Jerusalem. And following the First World War is also when we have the formation of the League of Nations, um, of which Iran is a, it's a very, it's the only Muslim country that is actually there. Are we good? Sorry, I think I should be. <laughs> um, 
Iran was the only Muslim country that was a uh, founding member of the League of Nations. Um, Turkey and Iraq joined in later years. But the point is, Iran was a, had a statehood. This is very important. Iran, unlike many other countries, unlike all Arab countries, effectively, has a statehood uh, history that goes, a statehood and sovereignty history that goes back quite a while. Now, in the early years, um, so, so long as you can say Iran has a policy, Iran is Iran of the, this is the sort of Pahlavi era, first the Reza Shah, the father, and, 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 and the son who comes in 1941. But the, the general approach is actually pro Arab, obviously. And the, the Arab opinion um, is opposition to Jewish settlement in Palestine. And Iran generally follows that. In 1935, Bahar Kazemi, Iran's envoy to the League of Nations, speaks, um, uh, you know, speaks sort of in favor of the Arabs of Palestine so much that he actually gets a note of thank you from Haj, uh, I mean, Hosseini. The famous or infamous view Mufti of Jerusalem at the time was this is just a one year before the Arab Revolt. Um, when, after the Second World War, when, Pal when Palestine is going to be divided, so the United Nations obviously decides at some point um, to divide Palestine into a, an Arab and a Jewish state, right, in, in November of 1947. But prior to that, actually, Iran. Again, shows you the long history of Iranian statehood. Iran is one of those states that gets a chance to send a representative and is be part of the UN um, system that goes to sort of visit Israel, Palestine, prepare a report, plan what to do. Nasrallah and Tazam, who later is the president of the UN General Assembly, is the Iranian diplomat who goes there. In recent years, we've had some, this is how memoirs can be found. So, so some of the memoirs of people who was in the street, that there was Latin Americans, um, and there were obviously sort of representatives of the Jewish agency of what was called the issue. Um, they've published some memoirs that shows, shed some interesting light on Antizam and sort of his views there. I think like a lot of people, he was, he went there with a sort of pro-Muslim and pro-Arab uh, orientation, generally speaking, but he was impressed by what the Jewish community had been able to achieve. Um, but at any rate, the attitude of Iran is very clear in those years. Iran, together with India and Yugoslavia, presents a, alternative plan, right? it's against the division or the partition of Palestine and it was called, it presents a federal plan that is rejected by the UN, the UN goes to the partition plan. And in the next few important votes, Iran votes against the membership of Israel and the United Nations. Now, these are very sensitive years, um, be conscious of the time, even though I have a very generous time here. Um, these are very sensitive years in the history of Iran, of course. In 1941, Reza Shah is overthrown. Muhammad Reza Shah comes to the throne. We have 12 years of relatively open conditions of the press. Um, the Iranian parliament you know, has genuinely democratically elected members who are able to voice views on certain things. The issue of Palestine becomes very important. So if I want to paint a very brief view of how this political scene is viewed at the time, the to the party of Iran, the communist to the party of Iran, which was formed in 1941, um, is unique in uh, having a lot of Jewish members. It's one of the first parties that allows uh, Jews to join, and it has a very active sort of Jewish membership. As Leo, historians like Leo Stenfeld has shown, they, this, this Jewish Iranians come to play an important role in the party. Um, but also not just because um, of the Jewish Iranians, but because the general line of the communist movement in the world, the communist movement led by the Soviet Union in 1947, changed its line on Zionism, had sort of had decades long policy of opposition to Zionism, it adopts a new line that sort of generally um, recognizes the Jewish right to self-determination. So as a result, the Tudor the party of Iran, it's the biggest proponent of ties with Israel. Not only it calls on the Iranian government to recognize Israel and establish relations with Israel, it celebrates Israeli independence. In the Iranian to the party meetings, to the youth meetings, Hava Nagila, which is something of a Hebrew hymn, um, careful to say not, it's not really a Zionist song, I, I just to say, but it's a, definitely a song that comes out of the issue. It's, it's sang between, um, it's sang in sort of communist meetings by you know, Jews and non-Jews and Iran. And as I said, the Communist Party, if you look at the uh, meetings, they're just like the Communist Party in the United States, actually, and the Communist Party of Great Britain, the Communist Party in many other countries, calls for open relations with Israel. Um, at the same time, there is the Pan-Iranist Party, which is sort of anti-Semitic. It works against sort of, you know, it works against uh, Israel, obviously, it, it, it speaks against it. Ayatollah Kashani um, claims that he's gonna uh, gather some people to bring them to Palestine to fight in the 1948 war. Um, to my knowledge, this didn't actually happen. 
Ayatollah Khashoggi was not able to mobilize anyone and take it there to fight the, uh, to fight in 1948 war. Um, but he definitely does claim that he's going to do it. The Mufti that we just talked about, who had tanked Iran in 1935, he's sort of active in the Iran press. He gives an interview to the Kehan against, against the Jews, as he says. You know, he sort of speaks in a very anti Semitic language against the international Jew, um, and he warns against Israel. So Israel is being discussed. Um, now, Mohammad Mossadegh, who, uh, who is a you know, who is obviously a proponent of uh, independence uh, for Iranian oil sector, for nationalization of Iranian oil sector. He comes to the scene. The movement of Mossadegh is viewed positively by some in Israel who see it as a fellow um, fighter against the British imperialism. Of course, Israel had come to be by fighting the British mandate and British occupiers. So, in fact, you'd be surprised perhaps to know that Israeli right wing, uh, the revisionist party, is the right of the Israeli uh, political scene, which is very sort of anti British, more even more than the, uh, the dominant trend in Israel, which is social democratic, but less anti British. Um, they, they celebrate Mossad, the revision is celebrate Mossad. At any rate, um, Iran recognizes Israel de facto when parliament is in recess under the government of Mohammad Saeed Maraghi, interesting prime minister born in Tbilisi. Um, and when the Mossad government comes, it's one of the first acts that it does is actually takes back the recognition. There are some murky accounts here because they sort of say there's a financial reasons they take it back, but Longer story short, um, there, there's definitely some in the Mossad government, including Fatemi, the foreign minister, who seem to have had a negative view. See, I'm doing what I sort of criticized earlier because we don't have a lot of accounts from the era, so we have to sort of go by what, what we have. But Fatemi definitely gives the speech in the parliament against um, against Israel. Lines of um, lines of conflict are being developed in, in a different way. This is, Nasser hasn't come to power in Egypt right, yet, right? That happens in 1952. But already Fatemi imagines a world of um, Iran allying itself with Arab opinion in a way that would be anti Israel. It seems to be happening. Well, obviously, in 1953, US backed coup in Iran puts an end to, um, to sort of an environment where that can be discussed freely. Um, and a different line follows. In the same era, I should also mention that there are some in the Iranian. Politics like, say, Hajali Razmara, well known uh, army figure who are also pro Israel because they see it as a, you know, as a, uh, as a sort of very competent dog. But the love relation between Iranian, let's say, left and Israel, of course, continues uh, for decades after. Again, these are parts of the history that sort of sometimes are forgotten, but this exists a lot, of course. Um, Jalal Ahmad goes to Israel, writes a very glowing. Uh, travel log that criticizes later, Darush Ashuri and others, they look, they look into Israel interestingly as a sign of sort of national spiritual awakening. They look at it and, uh, you know, they look at a sort of kibbutz example as a sort of communistic ex example. Um, but they, they kind of, the kind of line that becomes dominant in the late 60s and early 70s is very different. So to say, this was to set the, <laughs> set the scene with sort of Iran, Palestine, Israel, but then what is Shah's, what is Shah's actual policy? My argument is that, in fact, Shah's policy on Israel cannot be explained by subservience to the US, because he wasn't subservient to the US always. And he cannot be explained on a sort of a basic core level, but that, in fact, it is consistent with what he called national independent policy. Now, independence is always a, you know, it's, there's a normative value. We can talk about what you consider independent or not, but I'll try to show how you know, there, there, there are elements um, that if you want to adopt a framework, this framework of national development policy seems to explain um, Shaw's policy and this issue. Now, two quick sort of disclaimer about how I'm going to do this. Number one, I'm in the middle of this research. <laughs> so there's a lot more to learn. I think there's months more of reading because, um, you know, I started tagging what documents are related to this topic, and I realized almost every single document there is related because Israel Palestine comes out in every conversation. Um, and of course, I could go through the wars one by one and sort of look at Iran's policies there, but I think that wouldn't be as interesting. Um, and I haven't done work with all of them. The 1973 war is challenging, for example, because Zaidi was not the prime minister then, um, who was ambassador to the US, but they have different, different sort of files from there. But I'm going to talk about few aspects of how Shah approached the question of Israel-Palestine. 
And I hope there that I can show that it was consistent with his claim to an anti-Indonesian policy. And that perhaps this helps us have a different view of Shah's foreign policy. Now, as a you know, lifelong polemicist, <laughs> historian, sometimes I try to push in one direction or sort of I put a question mark, sort of think class differently about something. Um, I'm happy to be pushed back on, uh, you know, on some of these claims. Um, but I think nevertheless, it's coming in there. So I would say, I would sum up um, briefly the national independent policy with you. I would say that Shah was definitely an anti-communist. He was very clear, he hated communism. He thought communism should be fought. He hated the to the party in Iran. He was afraid of the Soviet Union. And globally, he, he like many other states under the era, he believed that communism was a global threat, right? The a specter of communism threatened him. Um, but it's important when we say that to remember what kind of anti-communisms are we talking about? Because there are many different sort of anti-communism. He is, he is a guy who claims he's a socialist. Again, you shouldn't forget. In fact, you know, I have to say, sort of my personal memories, I remember the first time I, um, um, I met the, the former queen of Iran and Farah Pahlavi, and you know, we were talking about sort of Marxism, different ideas for the era. And she said, well, you know, Shah was a bigger socialist than all of you. And he was a true socialist. And this, this I think it's important because we will see in the archival record, how does this show itself in the archival record? It shows that Shah, when he follows a policy, he believes that the way to fight communism is development. Now we can call this Bismarckian. I long ago, Otto Bismarck, Chancellor of Germany, had this idea that the best right way to fight the Social Democratic Party in Germany is to adopt policies, basically preempt them, adopt policies that help development. This was, of course, Kennedy's line in the United States in the Cold War. It was, it was a way of fighting the Cold War, but that's, I think, very important. So Charles is anti communist, but he believes, um, he believes in a state led development. It's important. He believes in a state led development, and he believes that a form of what he considers socialism needs to be there to give people um, what they need so that they wouldn't turn to communism. Um, he had, was a big proponent of the regional states. I, the relation between Shah and the United States and, and some other forces that we can see often goes through him supporting the other regional states. The King Hussein of Jordan, as we'll see, is an important part of this, and other states. I, he's worried about the stabilization of the region. He's worried about the growth of the forces that, after all, he has seen throughout his life. He comes to power in 1953, he has to live through just imagine yourself the ride that he has to go through before his overthrow in 1979. The 58 revolution in Iraq, the rise of Baptism. Um, you see kings fall around you. Um, it's, it's important. So that's an important element of his, his approach. The one that might surprise some of you um, is that he also cares a lot about the Muslim world. He believes, he believes in the concept of the Muslim world, you know, his words, not mine, um, and he believes in it. Now, I think um, Professor Milani, in his biography of the Shah, also sort of claims that what one of the things that really distinguishes Shah from his father is his approach to Islam, um, of how he prioritizes Islam against communism sometimes, and how sort of he views this question and his personal um, sort of religious views. But at any rate, Islam is important for him in a flexible manner, of course, and in sort of a civilizational manner. I, it's not sort of, we all know he wasn't a very um, great practitioner of Islam necessarily in his, in his daily life, but um, at any rate, um, he cares about Islam, he cares about the Shia faith, he cares about supporting religion in some ways. But I think what really interestingly brings a lot of this together is how much he cares about his alliance with Turkey and Pakistan. Again, I'm very grateful for the archives because there we can see that there's so much rich material um, there. I've also looked into other archives, like the National Archives of Britain about this. Um, so, but the Centro organization that I mentioned, the Centro and Regional Cooperation Development, RCD, this is Iran and its two big Muslim neighbors, Turkey and Pakistan. Um, the other thing, so Shah is a pan-Islamist and a socialist <laughs> so far, as I can be surprised that we have the other things that he's a neutralist. I, Shah goes out of his way to have relations with the both blocks. He goes out of his way. And he, a part of this is that, you know, they say there's this theory of under the shadow of Assad, that I, and he has come to power with the support of the US and, and the UK, and he knows it. Um, and he wants, to, he, wants, he wants to be independent. He wants to show that he's independent, he's that he's nobody's sort of, you know, he's, he's his own person. Um, but also, in some, he genuinely believes in this. Whether you, whatever shadow you see, he believes in this. And it's in the practice. I, 
Iran, it's sometimes hard to remember, Iran has relations, extensive relations with Soviet Union, with Bulgaria, with Romania, with Czechoslovakia, with Yugoslavia, later on with China, pretty much with the entire world. And we have the record of Iranian talks to the US and the Americans are not always happy with the kind of relations Iran has, but, but he does it anyway. In fact, Iran has relations with North Vietnam, um, pretty much with any country that it could have. Um, I guess not Albania, because that, that uh, I haven't actually looked into it, but I mean, I guess Albania was a, an extreme example. And then he also supports, the other thing Chahis is an anti-colonialist Afro-Asianist. He supports non-European states um, and acting to the UN. Um, and all of this shows itself in Iran's Israel Arab policy. Sort of get, you know, I, should, I should get going <laughs> further into this, but it's, this really does explain um, his, his approach to Palestine and its conflict with the regional countries. I, he cares about the stability of his neighbors. He tries, to, he tries to solve the conflict to the UN. That fifth point, sorry, I think I was yeah, sort of half explained it. I, he goes out of his way and he says, colonialism is over. He's against sort of aggressive actions by the West. He doesn't want them to tell him what to do. He says he believes they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't tell others what to do. And he believes in the UN because his institutions, he believes, are in equal weight for the first time. To the, it's, it's interesting that today, you can have a lot of leftist parlances, you can hear UN as a den of imperialists and all that. Of course, when you look at it from the other perspective, it was, it was the opposite because the imperialism had meant that a few European states could run things how they wanted. Now the fact that they had equal representation, even in some ways, no matter how flawed, was usually taken out. So the biggest fan of the UN were the first post-colonial states at the time. And Shaw aligns himself with those to a degree, to a degree, I should say. Um, and that's his approach to Israel. He emphasizes Iran's Muslim nature. He believes Iran should support Palestine very good. He advocates the UN, and he's very worried um, about the stabilization of other countries based on the conflict. So. Let's have a few. Uh, let's have a few examples, as I said. But I still do like a good story. So let me take you to the morning of June fifth, nineteen sixty-seven. This is a few days before Shah reached Slovakia. This was following his trip to Romania. He then goes to West Germany. He then goes to Paris. In the morning of June fifth, nineteen sixty-seven, I like to imagine very early in the morning, Manager of Ostrada, who is later the head of the Air Force, I believe, he's the head of Habib Industry. So that's the sort of Marines of the, of the army. Wakes Shah up because the Iranian embassy in Paris is just informed that the war has broken up. The, the war that everyone was worried for in the Middle East, and as we can see in the archives, there's a lot of worry for, the war has broken up. Two days later, he's already in Ankara. He goes from Paris to Ankara. Shah gives an interview that he can say it's sort of history. It's historic because it's repeated throughout from 67 to the end of Shah in 1979. Every time they talk about this, you know, as His Majesty said on June 7, 1967, and what is his position? He, he strongly condemns the occupation of Palestinian Arab lands by Israel. He says it's a form of um, aggression. He says it's a form of occupation. He says the age of these things has come to an end. In personal uh, talks later, he uses the strongest possible language. In fact, says at some point to someone, um, I think he said to an American, he says, you know, um, Israel is not doing to Palestinians, uh, you know, what Hitler did to Jews in the Second World War, which is obviously an exaggeration, but he does use, he does this use language. And, and the fascinating thing that I found in the archives is that Iran's public, private, when he talks to Israelis, when he talks to Palestinians, when he talks to the East Bloc, when he talks to the West Bloc, it says the same thing. It never changes. I, you know, you see several letters later in 1970s, Zahiri in a Televas interview says Shah's position on June 7th. And the war hasn't even finished by June 7th, right? But that's the position. It's the same one, the basic resolution of the UN and the International Security Council. And then Zahiri meets Abba Aban, the foreign minister of Israel, which is one of my favorite, my favorite files and documents is when Abba Aban and Zahiri and some others meet in a remote in Zahiri's beautiful villas out in Hesarak. And, uh, there's a very 
I'll talk about it later as well. It's a very fun sort of conversation because Zoyedi also has this way of funnily discussing some of these issues. Um, but then anyways, he says, you know, you know, Shah was the first head of state to condemn the occupation of territories following the June war. Our position is entirely clear. This might be a mundane issue for you, but it's not a mundane issue if you know something about the history of Israel. And the, because Israel is used to having people say one thing to them and then something to others, right? Why there are many who says, well, we know you're right in the war, but we have to sort of say the right thing. But not to Iran's credit in its approach, it's, um, it's, it's, it's consistent. One of the most fascinating files at the Zahiri archives are these mostly sort of handwritten, but you know, this one is printed, a lot of them are handwritten, of Iran's preparations um, in the fall of 1967, i.e. for the United Nations um, General Assembly and its meetings with, um, with different states. There are different proposals being made. There's the Yugoslav proposal. There's the joint American Soviet proposal. Um, there's sort of different Arab states have different proposals. One getting the details here, but what I can tell you is that Iran has a very active role. There. And again, it is not, um, it is certainly not that US says, hey, you've got to do this and then they do it. Um, it's anything but I, Iran pushes and Iran pushes consistently for the goals that I mentioned earlier. Iran is worried of what the effect of a resolution would be on King Hussein. Iran is worried of what it would be its effect on the future of the Egyptian state. Iran is worried of what would be its effect on, if Israel gets away with occupying the territory, what would it be its effect on the future of the international relation? And Americans, a lot of times are pushing the Shah in a certain way. Um, they ask certain questions in a certain way and they don't always give the answer. Usually, Roscoe and Irish Zahedi, as you can see here, um, they have a lot of discussions, for example. Eugene Roscoe, it's, it's a, he's a, it's sort of the equivalent to a deputy secretary of state at the time for political affairs, in the sense, as the secretary of state for political affairs. Um, I'm going to play a short video. This is Shaw's. Pilgrimage, they are at to the site that is the site of much uh, fight today, Dome of Rock. In Jerusalem, of course, it was controlled by Jerusalem. This is 1959. Um, it was controlled by before 1967, it was naturally controlled by Israel. I just play this as a sign to say the Shah and King Hussein have some of the closest relationships in the world. They met each other in bilateral trips between Amman and Tehran, you know, something like I think 12 times in a period. Uh, even more if you count throughout the entirety of their reigns. It was in these steps that King Hussein's grandfather, King Abdullah I, had been killed by a Palestinian assailant. Um, one thing about the kings of the era, they, they care about the history of kings being killed, regicide. They're worried about it. And this is an event that keeps coming. Let's see. That's, that's the Haram Sharif at the time. Before we get to Ahmed Khushchev, I'll stop this here. Um, so, the Shah's close support to King Hussein of Jordan is an important element. I, he's very worried of, of what will happen to King Hussein as a result of the conflict. He tells Israelis, if King Hussein talks to you, don't make it public, for example. One of the current concurrent conflicts. And Mesli Shah, um, let me just clarify here that a lot of times I mean the Iranian, whoever is representative of Iran, because surprise, surprise, by the way, it's about all this sort of internal stuff that we hear about the, you know, this guy had that position, that guy had that position. Iran does have a consistent position that is followed by whomever is doing the talk. Um, so I had the Shah very closely coordinate. I'll tell you of one funny sort of thing that they come to conflict later. But um, okay, so King was saying, right? So Shah really cares about the stability of Jordan. He's of course against the occupation in 1967. He's worried about the effect of Israeli um, discussions with King Hussein becoming public. 
Um, and he's worried about what happens in the internal affairs of, of Jordan. Can't give you a lot of details here, but I imagine some of you know, right? So when he talks to the PLO later on, um, you know, he's like, be kind to King Hussein, you know, don't overthrow him throughout the Black September and all that. So this is important. And I, and I say this as a standing because it's not just King Hussein. He cares about the stability of the Arab countries of the region. So he's very understanding when Israelis tell him, well, these Arab countries are against us and all that. He, Shah usually, Shah or Adish Israeli, they respond back that, look, they have their own domestic constituencies and they're worried of what happens if they take a, a two pro-Israeli position, they'll lose their, um, they'll lose their, how do we go? Okay. Yeah, and you see in RCD, i.e. with Turkey and uh, Iraq, sorry, Turkey and uh, pa pa Pakistan, he talks about the necessity of strengthening King Hussein. To Abu Aban al in December 1970, he says, God forbid, if something happens to Jordan, i.e. if King Hussein is overthrown, what will follow in Lebanon, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia? I key to Shah's approach is uh, making sure that the radicals in the Arab world don't come into power in more countries. By radical, we mean Baptist, sort of Arab nationalists. So what I have there. Um, yeah, Palestine as a Muslim issue. This is a message. It's a, believe it or not, a much, much shortened, summarized message that reads in much beautiful sort of Persian, very Arabic inflected and very sort of long to the president of Iraq, President RF at the time. Now, in Iraq, what Shah was worried for already happened. The key event in his life is the revolution of 1958, when the Hashemite family is overthrown in a revolution by Basim. And Iraq follows, uh, you know, basically to 2003, from 1958 to 2003, a succession of groups that are all either Arab nationalists or Baptists uh, come to power. President Arif is one of the Arab nationalists, known to be close to President Nasser at the time, a man who had a heavy conflict with Iran, of course, throughout this period. But Shah appeals to him as a fellow Muslim. He goes out of his way to say it's a Muslim issue. This is again not just in this message. Throughout, when, when the president of Shah meets with Arab Muslim countries, they say that they care about Islam, um, that they care about Palestine as a Muslim issue, that's a sort of civilization issue that they care about because they believe that this is part of his legitimacy. Um, that's that sort of approach. And they, you know, they sort of, it is not just words, right? They give support in different ways, they give support in the UN. Um, they care about this aspect. Which is also explains why the ties with the Israel are secret. This is one of my favorite sort of funny period. There's a so Iran has very, it's very open secret. Like Iran has extensive ties with Israel, as I said, people come and go, there's energy, there's ties, there's but despite that, it's officially sort of it's sort of officially not recognized. There's a there's a famous example that I read in sort of Lior Center book. I think there's a Moroccan envoy who is talking to an Iranian diplomat and says, I just saw an El Al flight take off from Tehran. And the Iranian diplomat says, no, his majesty, as his majesty says, we don't have recognized sites. He says, but I just saw a flight. And he says, well, I believe your majesty more than your eyes, <laughs> right? So, and here he says a very interesting sort of example because Israel basically says, Israel informs the foreign ministry that there's a plane that has to, pass, you know, sort of a stopping in Tehran for an hour. But because there's a diplomat, could you send even a lower level of foreign ministry for protocol so that you know we recognize there's an Israeli government or delegation here? Um, and Zahidis says that I accepted and I also sent ask Nasiri to send this five basically to see what's going on now in your stuff. But it shows that they're respectful to Israel, right? They they do the protocol, but also they're very, you know, when Abu Aban and, and Zahidi meet in Hesarak, you know. Zahidi says, well, you're welcome here. How do you like Iran? And Abu Aban says, I'm like, this is great. Wouldn't it be great to meet in the actual foreign ministry if you recognize us? And then Zahidi says, well, you know, if you want that, maybe you need to bring the peace. So he said, basically, November 22nd resolution, that's just a resolution 242 of 1967, if you follow the conflict, it's everyone sort of wants to stumble. And so Zahidi's position, basically what is Saudi Arabia's position today? He says, you want peace and relations with us? Make peace with your neighbors in the occupation and you can have open relations. We have no problem. And he goes out of his day and says, you know, he says Palestinians have a, you know, have a realist faction. There are, you know, there are those who recognize Israel, there are those who don't, but obviously those who don't are wrong because they're ignoring history. Um, but it, 
the position is getting very consistent. He also says, I have this group of people, I might take credit for the events. I'll let you do your calculus and with the sort of recent events to see if you, you have a Nostradamus in, in late Adishi Zahedi, but uh, there's definitely seems to be something. Um, the, the other fascinating meeting than, that I could see in the archives is Shah's meeting with Tito. Again, if you want to know what importance the archives have. So Shah meets with Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia, right? This important event in the history of the Cold War in my This is what we have before the archives, pretty much, right? right? This is the press reporting that is done. Tito went to Iran, south, right? I exaggerated a little bit. There's, there is some more, there's sort of reports given to the other ministers, but now we have everything that was said in the news. It's right in that room, you know, two minutes walk from here. There's a full report of what Tito and Shah talked about. Marshal Tito, of course, being the, one of the founders of the non-aligned movement, a leading sort of neutralist proponent. Um, you would think they shouldn't get along so much with Shah, which is supposed to be sort of so pro-West, pro-Cold War, but actually they do and they have a lot of common approaches and they talk about the common thing that they talk about Mind you, this is Marshal Tito, one of the closest people to President Nasser of Egypt. There are many scholars who believe, in fact, that Nasser can be sort of called a Titoist, perhaps, in some of his ideas. So you would think, you know, they should have a very different sort of approach to Shah. But what they agree on at the time, as you can see here, you know, what they sort of complain together about, Tito says, yeah, I also tell the Egyptians, you have to accept Israel, it exists. You can't just pretend it doesn't exist. You can't just want to. Uh, Sort of do it out of ignorance. Shah says, I know, not a drag, you know, they do that. And then, you know, Tito says, you know, when I meet with the Zionists, I sort of, you know, I bash them and say, you're terrible and you're doing these things. But then they found out what I told the Arabs. So they understand that I actually have sort of a logical view. My point is, these guys repeatedly, as we can say, in Shah's meeting with Czechoslovakia, in Shah's meeting with, with the president of Czechoslovakia, in Shah's meetings with Soviet officials, this is not the meeting of a uh, Two opposing sides of the Cold War debate that you know people would imagine. Right? Here as well, there's a lot of conversations about um, what can a what can a world of independent countries that are not sort of pushed around by by big powers look like. Okay, getting toward the end. Yeah, so let me just say one more thing here before my last slide. The this is work that I'm sort of undergoing. I'm interested in it as myself. I mean, as my work goes on, I'm, I found much new material in here. I'm not done yet. Then I can stay a few more weeks. <laughs> I can finish it. Um, but this is Iran's relation with Egypt. It's well known that Iran and Nasser didn't have a good relation. In fact, Egypt early on cuts relations with Iran in the early 1960s. Egypt gives funding um, to Basically, Egypt tries to fund an armed group uh, against the government of Iran. People like Ibrahim Yazdi, Ali Shayati, they worked to Cairo for a sort of short period. The organization of Sama is founded. Nasser starts calling the Persian Gulf the A-war, you know, so that, of course, that doesn't make the Shah um, happy. By the way, this is also, I love that in the, in the document, it shows up. If any person says Gulf, just Gulf alone, from having Gulf at the time, Zahedi or Shah, they don't wait. They don't like wait. They cut in the middle of the words and they say something. Um, in fact, they say that George Brown is a sort of leading British diplomat. Zahedi says, hey, I sorry, I thought you went to school. Aren't you like an educated person? Why do you do things like this? this is, and then George Brown says, look, this is the new British policy. And George Brown basically says, look, my document that I have here says the Persian Gulf. I just wanted to cut one word. You know, don't say Persian every time. So they're very sensitive about this. Or with Kuwaitis, um, Kuwaitis complain and say, look, it was the Persian Gulf, but some people just write Arab Gulf in the post and it's a traitor. It's a people, can you not return all their posts right? when they just happen to write everything? So it is a key issue for Iran. But at any rate, um, unlike what is, so we all know that Shah and Egypt, Iran and Egypt resumed diplomatic relations in 1970. President Nasser dies in 1970. We know that they have a very close relation with Sadat later on. So this seems to explain itself, right? Um, relations, Sadat Khan's new relations. Not true, not true. In fact, the resumption of diplomatic relations between Iran and Egypt is a 
few weeks before the death of Nasser and has a consistent process before. Zahidi cares about this, talks about it in different meetings at different times. Anytime he meets a lot of his Arab representatives, he says, we want better relations with Egypt. We support many of the Egyptian demands. We're not pro-Israel. We're happy to have relations with Egypt. Um, and that's the line that they push. Of course, he also has very tough words for Nasser. In fact, in one meeting, he gets into hot water with Shah, where he says, and excuse my language, but it's in the archives, he says, well, I'll tell you what I think about Nasser. Nasser is a prostitute. He sells himself to, um, to different sort of lenders and Shah really gets angry at him because he says it's not diplomatic language, you can't use language like this. Um, but these two things, now the fun work of the historian is to look at when the changes happen and how does Shah sort of, how does Iran try to explain it in that <laughs> But I'll end with saying, I had a 10 minute version of this talk before, which I ended with this slide, and I want to end it here again after I've done all the work here. I'll end with saying, two meetings within two weeks of Arabic Zahedi, Iran's prime minister at the time, with two different figures, show something of Iran's approach. December 14, he met, as I said, referred to a few times in my talk, in Hesar meets with Abu Iran. The position that Iran puts there is clear. He wants the occupation of the territories to end. In no uncertain terms, he condemns them on, on principle. He says, this Iran doesn't believe you can, it's land grabbing, it's wrong. He condemns them in a strategic result. He says it leads to the weakening of different Arab states in the region. He conditions 41 years before the Saudi Arabia did the Arab peace initiative of land to peace. He says, you want peace in Israel? We're happy to have peace with you, but you need to end the war. You need to end the occupation. And Abu Aban sort of uses diplomatic niceties and he's all oh, with the Persians. No, he says, we love this country, things are great. Iran has a very consistent position. He just says, well, you know, thank you for changing the topic, but you need to end the occupation repeatedly. And when he meets with Khalid al Hassan, one of the leaders of the PLO, um, and other, there are other meetings with the PLO, Iran offers support to the cause. He says, we believe that. The, so far as territories need to be liberated, we believe. So far as the Muslim cause, we believe in it. Iran, of course, offers half a million dollars. You can see the actual check that Professor Milani had written about before, but I saw the actual check in the archives. Um, Iran gives to Yasser Arafat. You can see Yasser Arafat's huge letter of thank you to his great, his majesty, the Shah, who thanks him for the support. I looked up. In another speech of Yasser Arafat I think 72 hours of his notes where he's speaking to some sort of Iranian groups who were fighting together with the Palestinians in sort of Lebanon. And he says, the Shah is the head of the imperialist henchman of the region, but he got money from him at the same time. And he, um, as I said, thanked him in that way. Necess necess diplomatic necessities. And uh, he sort of put that down. Iran is also clear as to, in Khaled Hassan, he says the same thing. For example, there's a very funny sort of, this is December 1970, right? So September 1970, Black September happened. The Jordan instability was a PLO. And then the Khalidassan says, oh, we also care about King of Jordan and you know, we, we don't wanna do anything to stabilize Jordan. And then Zadi says, well, you know, I'm hijacking four planes in two weeks and taking them is probably not great for the security of the country. Um, it's also the case that the, the Palestinian representative brings up possibility of Iran giving armed support. And I kid you not, in the actual diplomatic files, it says, whenever they said that, I just changed the topic, which is a great, uh, great diplomatic tactic to just sort of say, oh, isn't the better nice when they sort of talk about that. But I think the two meetings together, with everything else that I have babbled about for the last 40, 50 minutes, shows that Iran did have a consistent approach to the Palestinian Israel conflict and to the Arab Israel That the basis of the approach was what Tehran regarded as Iran's national interest. That it was certainly not a one sided support of Israel. And that, in fact, was predicated of what it believed was a just resolution to the conflict. That it did not give concessions to Israel um, whenever they asked for it that it did not give concessions to the US on, on the request of the US to Israel when it was asked for. 
and that it cared at least as much as it cared for how its relation to the US and Israel was. At, in the same amount, it cared about the, its standing as a Muslim country and its standing to be its, its neighbors in the Arab and Muslim world. Adopting that view, we can see that if you study <coughs> Iranian foreign policy, and if you see the, study Iranian actors based on their own words and their own actions, you're going to have a different view than if you see them as spoken in the words of others. And now that this, these archives here make this possible, I hope you can have this corrective view. It will, no matter what you think about the Shah, how much you hate or love, as we have heated twists in Iran today, it will give us a better image, a more clear image of how our country's foreign policy made, was made and how the Cold War in which Shah and Iran were, were important actors um, give us also a better image of that global program. Thank you for your patience. Well, there's a variety, there's a very rich variety of documents there. A lot of them are official foreign ministry documents. You can see them, the line and the, the line with the sword and the sun at the top. That shows these are official foreign ministry documents. Um, what I the kind of cross-referencing I've done, there are there are two kinds of cross-referencing that one can do. Number one, there are friends in Iran that do sometimes research. This this exists in Iran in the foreign ministry, just that they are not given access to by many. But there are people in Iran who are university professors who are allowed to do research about this. And sometimes we're friendly with them and sort of we can, we can look at some stuff. But also um, other Cold War stuff. So if Shah meets the Czechoslovakia, the Czechoslovak guy usually tells someone else about it. And you can look at sort of records there. But um, yeah, so there's official archives. There is personal stuff of, of Adeshi Zahedi. Um, but not, I mean, there are different levels of personal. There are personal letters, for example, obviously, that he wrote to different people. And there are files and records of the embassy. Um, um, yes, yeah, so there's a variety. There's a variety of that. Right? How do I? Yes, okay. 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 Your enthusiasm on the subject must This is, a, this is a great question of how the policy is made. And the archives give us a limited answer because they're a limited period and I have, so haven't finished them. They're, you know, I was scared of how many boxes there are. Um, you know, I'm yeah, a bit true with them. But I would say, um, basing myself on things like Abbas Milani's biography of the Shah, or other biographies of the Shah that exist, is that, I mean, about neutralism, obviously Iran supports firmly the US in the Cold War. And, you know, I started saying anti communism um, but I believe Shah wants to be independent. He wants, he cares about Iran's independence because his view is not just a cold war. His view is the long history. In fact, it's amazing. There are meetings in which Shah and Adi go and they start with 1907. They say, you know, in 1907, Britain and Russia cut him up. And for us Iranians, the independent sovereignty of the country against sort of imperialist neighbors that always intervene are, are always important. I would understand why Shah wouldn't be like this, right? After all, which kind of a self-respecting ruler says, no, no, you know what I really love is to be subservient to someone else, right? I think, and I think by the way, in Cold War studies, if you look, this is being said now about all sides. There's new work that says, no, you know what? Czechoslovakia wasn't always subservient to, to the Soviet Union in every question. Of course, as Prague Spring 1968 showed, there was a limit to how much independence you can show. But there were Czechoslovak communist leaders who look, look at it the other way. Why did 1956 in Hungary, 1968 in Czechoslovakia happen in the first place? It did not happen because, unlike what the Soviet Union said, these are not sort of fascists from Berlin who came in, right? These were local communist leaders who wanted to do something else. Shaw was the same. He was in the Cold War. If we see the quotes as the Cold War, as I do, about communism and anti communism, he was anti communist. He believed this communist 
threats that had started in the 20th century was bad for civilization, was bad for humanity, was you know, needed to be fought. Um, but he wanted to also maintain Iran's sovereignty um, and independence. As for Irish Zahiri's own voice, I think it takes much more as a research for me to really sort of um, figure it out. What I see here is a very close, close relation between Zahiri and Shah, and Zahiri doing dot by dot what the Shah sort of wants. It. Whenever there's a disagreement, it's time. So I just want to make a minor uh, historical point. So in the second Thank you so much. That's a very important. That's a kind of interesting. But thank you so much. That's exactly that's exactly what I meant. Diplomatic recognition, um, dip diplomatic relations is what they meant. From side matter they sort of early on they did the recognition it was always there. I think it was him here and then. Yeah, I, I, I was really involved. But to be clear, so I, I of course I don't believe Shah's regime was socialist, right? I mean, I, I don't believe that at all. In fact, this was not sort of a talk about Iranian economy. What I tried to say was that when Shah said what he understood his anti communism as, right, in conjunction with some others, is that he believed in a state that development, as I said, right? He believed the state. This was a conversation, right? For example, West Germany, he had a conversation with West German officials. And West Germans would be like, you know, why are you not more capitalistic? Why, why does the free, why does the state, private sector doesn't have more power than that? And Shah would say that we need a state development. Of course, there were many other non socialist countries that had a state of development, perhaps more or less successful than Iran. It's not sort of the topic of my talk, but like South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, right? These are all anti communist um, and also a state of development. My point was that it was a state of the, like the development, and Shah himself claimed that was socialism. It's not to take him at his claim, but it does make a difference, right, between other forces. And also in the region, he believed in this modernity. I'll give you another example. And that's again what I mean when I heard. Prior to the coup in Oman in 1970, which took care of the old, I love this sort of region there because there's no democracy. So the, the 1970, there was a coup. The king came and he was in power and two years ago he died. So, well, in 90, before 1970, coup, Shah kept saying, we need something done in Oman because this guy, the King Saeed at the time, is basically too backward. He has no social program, right? So I, if you remember, I actually associated it not with socialism, but with Bismarck and Kennedy, sort of other answers. I, he, believed, he believed that the way to fight socialism, the way to fight sort of communist movement was to, uh, was to do a state of development and to make sure people are sort of grown up with poverty. But how successful he was, um, it's, it's a different question. Naturally, if he had been entirely successful, we wouldn't have had the United States Um So, right? So definitely he was, as you say, he was not sort of fully successful in neutering 
composition. Um, yeah, based on the economic analysis. So, any yeah, this, this is a great question. I mean, I want to say actually, you know, I don't like the term pro Israel myself because what does it really mean to be pro a country? But you, you're definitely right that to the party asked for recognition of and diplomatic ties with Israel. It celebrated the day of Israeli independence earlier. Right? It didn't celebrate like in 1951, let's say Israel founded 1948. It celebrated 1951, 1952. Um, why did it do that? The, the Tudor party. The Tudor party celebrated. It says, you know, we salute the great, brave nation of Israel on its independence. In 1948 war, most importantly, along to the party, along with the world communist movement, mostly supported Israel. In fact, the party had, had a debate with the Iraqi Communist Party at the time, because the Iraqi Communist Party was more anti-Israel. Okay, why did they do that? But I want to start to emphasize, even Iraqi Communist Party, right? So I want to start in the Arab world, which was a little bit more anti-Israel. Iraqi Communist Party in the 1950s in fact, had a slogan of arab israeli brotherhood. They believe that's the way to go. Why did they do that? The reason was this. The reason was that in 1947, when the Soviet Union changed its position, um, there was a recognition in the communist movement that we were opposed to Jewish settlement, we were opposed to what they call sort of Zionist colonization of Palestine. But now things are different because effectively there are two nations in this place called Palestine. There's the Jewish nation, there is the Arab nation, and we believe in equal rights for them all. So the pro-Israeli was, they said, the other position was that the Jews have no right here, they don't have a right to a state, they don't have a right to anything. They believe that no, Jews do have because they defend the Jewish right to state of the nation. They believe that Jews should have a right to form their own state, right? Unfortunately, they also really ignored the Nakba, I ignored the expulsion of 700,000 Palestinians. They didn't entirely ignore it, but they certainly didn't emphasize it um, in, in, the, in the 1948 war because the, the Jewish uh, issue, right, the Jewish settlement also was seen as sort of a socialist experiment. It was seen, you know, it was very overwhelming to the left, right? The first Israeli elections, the first party that came up was Mapai, the Social Democratic Party. The second party was Mapam, a more left-wing party which had a sort of pro-Soviet Union. But the leaders of Mapam in 1953, when Stalin died, got up in the Knesset in Israeli parliament and sang eulogies of Stalin, right? Um, Stalin that had been involved in an anti-Semitic plot in the last year of his life. So this was the really how left Israel was viewed. Um, but that's one thing. The other thing I would say is that they saw Israel. Think about the scene then. Who is like, what's the scene of the region? They saw Israel as a potential anti colonial nation that had fought Britain, because we forget that, but they had fought Britain. They had militarily fought Britain for a couple of years. So the right wing of the movement had openly fought it. The left wing of the movement was now Ben Gurion famously during the Second World War said, We will fight the white paper as if there are no British, and we will fight the we will fight the white paper as if there are no Nazis, and we will fight the Nazis as there are no white paper. White paper was a British policy of 1939 that had severely limited Jewish um, immigration to Palestine. So, so they so they saw Israel as a potential anti-colonial um, against Israel Britain. They also saw it as a new nation that could go any way. Mind you, you'd be surprised. The same people who are for Israel, they're very anti-Zionist because they attack the Zionist leaders. They attack Ben Gurion. They say he wants to vet. Israel to the Western camp, which is what it did. They hated the Israel West German agreement that was compensation. Even today, as we speak, the member survivors of the Holocaust in Israel get compensation based on that same agreement. They hated it because it said you shouldn't, because West Germany was bad. Right? Um, they wanted Israel to be part of the socialist bloc and they, they pushed for that. Um, yeah, so this oh, and the other side of this conflict, shall we not forget, were all the Arab. Uh, countries that were, they were seen as poor British soldiers, right? They were just, then there was no Nasser, there was no progressive Arab leader at the time, right? What, what I mean, they were progressive Arab leaders, but they were in power, right? So the Egyptian army, the, the Transjordanian army, the Arab Legion, which was the army of Jordan, was literally led by a British general, Luke Pasha, right? So they saw the fight as between British Arab reaction leaders and this Jewish democratic, basically, republic. There was a lot of flaw in this image. Definitely. There was a lot of flaws. I said it led to the ignoring of the Nakba for one thing. Um, but I would say 
This is topic that I care a lot about. Basically. I would say there's something to be said about, something positive has to be said about the communist approach. The communists advocated a two-state solution, if you will, based on recognition of the self-determination rights of both nations consistently from 1947 to today. To today. The Communist Party, the Communist Party of Israel today, which is a Palestinian majority party, advocates the same thing that it did in 1947. Two all tough years of the conflict where the Iranian left and the Arab left all took an anti-Israeli position that basically said the Palestinian position, in fact, the PLO's position was that the Jews were there had no rights. Jews who had come after 1917 or after what they call onset of the Zionist invasion had no rights there. And this was a majority view. And in Iranian left, there was also huge debates between, for example, Bagher Momeni and Ali Keshta. So it was sort of a debate as to what should your approach be. And it was very hard. They took this approach to Israel Palestine that was very unpopular with, with the masses. Um, but they took it because they believed uh, they, they believed in this principle. So yeah, I would say it was consistent. Thank you so much. There are, I haven't gotten to them. There is, there is social. Uh, Abi Zaidi was already ambassador, right? By the time, by 1972, he was ambassador. I think he becomes ambassador in 1972. I'm not sure before or after the visit, but there is some more. Um, there is documents even talking about the visit afterwards and about the arms agreement afterwards, uh, but I haven't really looked in them. Um, but Shaw's, but you know, I didn't talk about the 1973 Yom Kippur War, right? So we had an hour, so, you know. Um, but I would say that, um, by the time the Yom Kippur War comes, of course, Shah later on promises, for example, to um, his famous, there's a famous interview, I would say, this, right? there's a famous interview with Mike Wallace, and he says, are you going to guarantee that you will sell oil to Israel? And he says, well, I can't do that in English. <laughs> no, I'm not godfather of Israel. Right? In fact, in the same interview, he says something very sort of concerning, that basically we consider anti-Semitic today. He says, well, Jews have a lot of power in the United States, and Mike Wallace is Jewish himself. Jews have a lot of power in the United States. They control the media, they control, the, you know. So, uh, you know, and then he says, in the same interview, the guy says, well, you know, Israel, if Israel gives up Abu Dis, so Israel had basically occupied half of, Egypt, half of the Sinai uh, Peninsula and was using the oil. It's just the stealing the oil, basically, just pumping the oil and using it. And he says, oh, if, if Israel gives up Abu Dis, would you sell oil to Israel? And the Shah says, well, Abu Dis doesn't belong to Israel to begin with. It belongs to Egyptians. It's not like they do a favor if they give up whether I'll decide to sell oil to them or not. So long story short, we know that Nixon was sort of very pro-Israel. Nixon, who is also famously, of course, has a long history of anti-Semitic remarks. He was pro-Israel in the 1973 war. Um, but Shah definitely did not have a one-sided pro-Israel stance in the 1973 war. He cared a lot about, again, Egypt and his close comrade, Amr Sada at the time. And if anything, the dominant line, if you read the media of the time, it's basically like, who the hell does he think he is, the Shah of Iran? Like in 73, 74, who, what does he think he can have, you know, have his own policy? He's basically seen as a nuisance, not as someone who, uh, who just easily sort of follows uh, the trace line. Yeah, I think there are similarities. Obviously, there are differences given the time. Um, I mean, I compared Shah's approach to sort of the Arab Peace Initiative of 2001 of Saudi Arabia, right? Peace for land. Unfortunately, peace never came. Um, sorry, land never came, but they gave the peace. You can say that's the most concerning thing with Abraham, of course, is that they sort of accepted the recognition of Israel without Israel even an inch of Palestine. But I would say that Zahiri does say, again, if you want also, Zahiri does say in 97, he says, in 30, 40 years, Arab will recognize. The thing about the, the thing that bothers Shah and bothers Tito, as I say, and bothers a lot of others, is that they say there's some in the Arab side who basically want to pretend like Israel doesn't exist. They want to pretend like it doesn't exist and say we don't like them and they go out of the way. As I said, they even make these anti-Semitic remarks. In fact, there are other parts of you know Zahidi usually calls them the Jews, by the way. He does usually not even say Israelis in the side. You know, he 
the sense that are the Jews. And the point is that it's not like, but you know, they, there is a sort of realism. Right? Zahiri says, Zahiri and Shah in the community say, you have to recognize that Israel exists. You can't pretend that it doesn't exist. I mean, hey, Edward Said, the great Palestinian scholar, basically said the same thing at some point. And he said, you can't, you don't even say the name of Israel. You can't ignore that it exists. So I think in this way, um, in this way, this was, it's the, the UAE um, and other countries have come to what was Iran's position before that, and then so Egypt's position in 1997, even Jordan's position in 1994, that they, they need to play ball. But I would say this actually, I would say, I would say the Iranian approach was favorable because Iran didn't give up on its opposition to the occupation. As I tried to show, didn't give up publicly, didn't give up privately, didn't give up on talking to either side. You know, unfortunately, the UAE has. I, the UAE today, they went from not recognizing Israel, they went from, you know, promoting crazy anti Semitic stuff. I mean, not the UAE, but some on the Arab side, you know, said Anne Frank's diaries were a forgery. <laughs> Top US Saudi diplomats said that in the UN once. Um, they went from that to now they don't even recognize anything on Palestinian side. They don't have, they don't recognize any the PLO effectively. I mean, of course, they recognize them, but my point is they don't prioritize them. You can see their stance in last year's war and others, right? So I would say that's the difference, that they went all in in this way overnight, whereas Iran was uh, was more, uh, tried to be more both sides. I was wondering whether in, in the archive? Oh, Sorry, what about the what about the Santari? About Israel? Yeah, I mean they so they meet they meet the Communist Party of Israel. Esan Tabari and other communist leaders, they meet Communist Party of Israel's leaders in international conferences. Um, their approach is basically the same. The Twitter party of Iran, it changes in 1979, and that's sort of what I'm trying to do. Obviously, if you know, Twitter party changed in 1979 overnight, almost, you know, Iraj just kind of is replaced with Nureddin Kianuri, and they adopt a new line. But the Bahari Keshkar debate that I told you is interesting. By the way, I love that because it's a debate in the introduction of a book. It's a, Keshka translates a book by some sort of left-wing Israelis about the book, I think it was called Class Nature of Israel, but the Matzpen book, like the Trotsky's Matzpen book, but it's a sort of a very critical of Zionism. And he writes a sort of introduction, then Bagher Momini writes another introduction to the next edition, right? So it's a strange debate in the introduction of this book. But Bagher Momini basically says, I don't know, and who was, I would say, kind of generally like Iraj Iskander in his approach to the conflict. Um, he basically says, look, we believe we, have, we need to support what they call the camp of peace and socialism in Israel and all that, but we don't believe that Zionism is fascism, as was the line of Keshtian and others, that needs to be destroyed, it needs to be kicked out, it's the kind of language of the PLO um, and PFLP, and you know, these groups were, of course, close to the Iranians, the Iranians, Iranian guerrillas fought, fought together with PLO and PFLP in, in the Jordan conflict that I talked about, September 1970, the Iranians were killed, there's the graves of Iranians. Um, in Palestinian camps in, in, in Lebanon, right? Of, uh, you know, Al Khalili has written sort of about it and others. Um, there was very close, uh, there was very close links. The Twitter party had a different approach in 79. After 79, um, it, it starts to change, but even then it doesn't quite, I haven't actually seen, you know, there, there are still, you know, they still have their nuances. I, I should also say that, of course, the Iranian Twitter party continued to have an important Jewish membership. And in fact, the leadership of the Jewish community in Tehran was by Iranian communists, right? Um, at the time, i.e., when Abi Belghanian, Jewish Iranian businessman, is, is this very emotional scene in the Samples book and work. I mean, Abi Belghanian was executed, you know, sort of as a Zionist spy by the Islamic Republic. The people who have to do Jewish religious rights are these Iranian Jewish communists who are very anti Zionist themselves, right? Um, but had to now do this sort of Jewish religious rights. For this man. So I would say the Tudor party um, yeah, always had a different approach than, uh, than other groups. I would also just sorry add one more thing, and that's that the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s has periods in which it takes very anti-Israel turns to the degree that, again, promotes material that are basically at the same time. It sort of publishes books 
There's an infamous book called Zionism without embellishment from the 1960s. There are other books, there's a book called Zionism Beware. And these books were translated to Persian and promoted, but again, not so much by the Tudor party as by uh, the Mujahideen Khal and the People's Fadayan and sort of different groups. I would, it, was, it was surprising to me that a lot of this stuff sort of, I would say, it's a very harsh opposition to Israel didn't actually come from the Islamists. It came from sort of the leftists who promoted some Soviet material. To the party today? Well, as far as I know, um, well, I would say the Tudor party exists uh, on paper. Um, it has a leadership in, in Berlin. It has a new leader called Mohammed Omidbar. Again, long history of the Congress history is lovely because there's a long continuity. Ali Khavari was the last leader of the party who was elected in the 18th plenum of the party in Bratislava in 1983. Passed away at the age of 90 something a couple of years ago. Mohammed is a new party, but it's a shell. I mean, I imagine there's a few people. They, they're recognized as such by different communist parties. They show up to events and there are people in Iran who are their supporters. Um, they don't have a real presence. They don't have an extensive presence in Iran. But you know, if you have, yeah, I mean, I would say they're not sort of popular within the young leftist youth in Iran, but there's some in them. And there are some splitter groups like Rahit Kudya and others who have, who have some support, but they're, they're quite a few. I can't, I can't estimate that. I can't estimate. But I would say this to the party, even on the eve of the 1979 revolution, he had a very small presence in Iran. Maybe he had 200 of them, something like that. Um, but then when they were, you know, I'm not saying that they would be in a revolution that they would grow, but they basically, the, a communist party like that doesn't have sort of a, I don't, I don't think they have a lot of members. I, you know, they have some members in, in exile where they can openly organize. I would say, based on what I know about the organization, they would have a couple of hundred members at most. This is actually an excellent question. I saw you know, I should say to me, I didn't plan this question. It's an excellent question because I um I, I wanted to talk about it. So one interesting thing is so excellent point because Turkey has open relations with Israel, right? They have it as early as 950. In fact, they have an intelligence triangle, Iran, Turkey, and, and Israel that they do some intelligence with. Pakistan and the Arab doesn't have it. So what's this strange thing that happens? Here's I'm gonna get it a little bit conspiratorial. There is meetings of Israel, Turkey, sorry, Turkey, Pakistan, and Iran. When they talk about everything in the region, everything, they go country by country. They like together, they have a shared view. That's why they say Iraq, then they go to Libya, then they talk about every country except Israel. I guess the agreement was we don't talk about Israel with Pakistan. And when it's unavoidable, i.e., for example, the six, seven war, if you meet in July, in fact, my, I have a little conspiracy theory that they, they postponed one of the meetings of our city because they're too close to that and they're too tense, right? It's clear that they postponed it. The reason is not clear, but I think that might have been one of the reasons. But when they do talk about it, they sort of brush over it and they'll say some general things. And uh, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's important. It's an important trick here, actually, because, you know, Shah cares a lot about this axis of Iran, Turkey, Pakistan, but Pakistan obviously has no relation with Israel and is quite hostile to Israel. So, whereas they share the lines, for example, on Iraq, right, they have similar positions, sort of anti communism against sort of revolutionary positions. And they're also void sometimes of Pakistan's growing ties to China, right? I think one great project that can come out of this archives is on Iran's position on the India Pakistan wars, so on Kashmir issue, of course, on the war of liberation of Bangladesh. Someone has to do that, right? Um, but the archives are great on that. So there, so the conflicts like that happen, and yeah, I find it strange that sometimes they can go out missing for hours and they don't mention that. Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff about Iran-Turkey relations in the archives, you know, of, of different meetings. And, and 
because of personal stuff you mentioned, I guess there's a lot of even sort of personal notes. That, uh, Well, surely that's what <laughs> that's what that's what we do in this line of work. <laughs> it wasn't like my hobby rotary <laughs> the rotary club talk. So yes, definitely it's going to be. Um, I think first thing I want to publish an article about the ties between the sort of communist movement in Iran in relation to Israel and Palestine um, in the Iranian studies journal, hopefully, and then uh, yeah, and some work on this later on. But it's academic pace, so it takes a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you.